Uh, and our speaker today is Bob Birchfield. Bob is a member of our uh, planning committee as well as uh, USF. And uh, he will tell you uh, how he's going to conduct questioning, whether he wants you to uh, put things in the chat or raise your electronic hand or your real hand, and when he would like for you to do that. Uh, he will be talking to us today about uh, breaking the seal, an informed perspective on Judeo-Christian literature. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Bob. Uh, thanks, Jim. Um, yeah, as uh, I, I like people to ask questions as I go, um, like after each slide, when I'm done with each slide, if you want to ask a question, uh, putting it in the chat would be great. Um, and if you um, ask it verbally, please mute yourself after asking the question so that uh, there, there's no feedback or anything like that. Alrighty. Um, so uh, I have to admit that I have no formal training in theology. I put it in quotes. <laughs> Is it really theology? Um, but I see this as actually an asset. Um, having formal training could can be can actually be a liability. Uh, it can it can sort of impair a person's vision to a certain extent. Um, I was raised in an unchurched household. I, I refer to it as, as attending the church of Saturday morning cartoons, which was actually for me a, a wonderful experience. Uh, my mother is, has, was raised a Baptist, but she rejected the Baptist faith. Um, she even, at some one point in her life, she even taught um, Sunday school for, for Baptist church where she, where she grew up. Uh, my father was raised uh, in a family where my where his father was a uh, member of the Masons, something that that we've kind of recently found out in our in our family. I had no idea, um, but um, my my father's background is probably something on the order of um, uh, Mennonite or something like that, Pennsylvania Dutch, um, but not of the not of the Amish variety. Um, my first encounter with biblical literature, uh, I've, I've, of course, I've, I've encountered Bible stories, you know, here and there, and there's always things on TV and stuff like that. But I never actually read the Bible until after I graduated from college, and I was uh, recommended by um, a partner of mine that I, it would be a good idea for me to, to have exposure to the Bible. And one of the first things that I encountered was the story of Adam and Eve. And it's like this, this, this fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. I was like, my goodness, what is this? There's, there's no apple in this, in this story. Where did the apple come from? That was, what's one of my, one of my uh, biggest questions about the Bible. What the heck is this apple all about? Or where, why is there no apple there? And where did the apple come from? Um, uh, and personally, I, I don't consider myself to be an atheist anymore. Um, because, uh, I, I learned that, uh, Christians were considered atheists because they have no respect for the gods. I personally, I don't worship gods, but I, I at least I can understand what what gods are all about. So I'm not going to, I, I'm not going to side with the atheists. Uh, but I am a non-theist, uh, and, and I sometimes refer to myself as a pantheist. I find that that's an excellent label to use when I'm with children because children can get kind of creeped out by words like non-theist or atheist and stuff like that. Um, Let's see. One other thing that I did, should have put here as a disclaimer is that this presentation does not represent the views of other Unitarian Universalists, only my own. All right. Are, are, if there are no questions, then we can move on to the next slide. Slide three is up. All righty. Slide three. Now, this, this is an, a quote from Isaiah. For, for you, this whole vision is nothing but words sealed in a scroll. And if you give the scroll to someone who can read and say, read this, please, they will answer, I can't, it is sealed. Or if you give the scroll to someone who cannot read and say, read this, please, they will answer, I do not know how to read. This is, this is a, it reflects exactly what, how I felt when I first read the Bible. It was like, it was completely alien to me. It had all kinds of very bizarre references and allusions, metaphors, things, that references, allusions and references that, that I had no clue about. I, I was com like completely in the dark. I read it from cover to cover and yet, and yet I, I really didn't, fully understand it. And, and I, I sort of thought it was, I felt it was kind of like watching a, watching a Monty Python uh, comedy sketch when I was a teenager and not, and having half of it go completely over my head. 
Um, and, and, and that's what a lot of the Bible is to even, even the, the quote unquote theologians, some of the, the people that I've read who, who, uh, studied the Bible back in the, in the early, early centuries. Um, they, they, like, they looked at the book of Revelation and they said, this is, this is, I, I have no idea what's going on here. This is completely, completely obscure to me. Um, so l later on in life, I did I did um, learn a little bit more about the time and place uh, that the, that the events took or that are chronicled and somewhat in, a, in and also some of the uh, cultural allusions and things like that. So those those that really helped me to to get a better grasp of what's going on with the Bible. Um, okay, so um, let's move on to the next slide. Okay, slide four is up. All righty. Now, um, the pagan pagan literature is very rich as a lot of um, a lot of uh, cultural allusions that can can really help in looking at Jewish literature. They the some people might think of the pagans as being completely isolated from Judaism and, and from Jews and vice versa, but that's actually not the case. Um, there was there been there's a lot of of connection there. A lot of very, a lot of similarities and a lot of parallels, and, and in fact, um, some of the early Christian uh, apologists have claimed that that the pagan philosophers ripped off Jewish literature. <laughs> there, there may have been some, there may have been some learning from there involved, but uh, I don't, I wouldn't say that they ripped them off. Um, so some of the things that we see in pagan literature, the use of talking animals, and um, the word there is stories is wrong. That's supposed to be stories. Animals in stories, the Aesop's fables, for example. Um, we see this in in uh, modern kitty kitty media uh, with and talking animal cartoon characters. Um, and now, the, something one of my interesting things that came up in my studies of pagan literature is the the, the dragon metaphor in um, Celtic culture. The dragon was a uh, was a metaphor for an invading invading army that the army would destroy the countryside with fire, uh, the fire breathing dragon. So, um, and the dr draconian is a, a word that relates the, to the dragon. Uh, and then, then this, um, so we see dra the dragon in, in the the literature of of. Um, uh, Revelation, for example, uh, but another kind of interesting thing is to see the, the kind of the dragon at work in act, actually in the in the older biblical literature, uh, the, the the destruction with fire, the fire breathing dragon. So the, you could you could consider the the, the devastation caused by uh, the Old Testament God as being somewhat very akin, akin to the the uh, the dragon invaders of, of of Celtic and Celtic society who were mostly the invaders from either um, actually I don't think the they had they had an invasion from uh, Carthage but I don't think that would qualify as a dragon like invasion but the the Roman invasions were definitely definitely qualified in that in that line um, on the other side of of the Jewish um, world. The, on the eastern side, we have Zoroastrians, and there's an interesting uh, uh, Zoroastrian connection between the moon and cattle, and um, uh, this is appropriate for, the, for the, um, the, the Chinese New Year because it's the year of the ox, and the, the, so the Zoroastrians considered the, the, the horns of the moon to reflect the horns of an ox, and they considered the moon to, they associated the moon with the ox. And then, of course, we have a lot of ox, a lot of ox references in Jewish culture. Strong as an ox, strong as a wild ox. Um, and then, of course, there's the sacrifice of cattle. Uh, there's the the golden, the golden calf, which is not a lunar. That's not a lunar symbol because gold is more associated with a solar, as a solar um, metal. Um, so, but there were, I believe, I have seen some allusions to a, a solar ox, uh, cattle, solar cattle deity, in archaeological references to the Middle East. Um, and it would be natural to, to, to consider a, 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 the the, the uh, if cattle, if the moon is associated with with cattle, then maybe the sun is as well. 
Um, now, Assyrian literature is even closer, and um, Assyrian literature, we'll up to talk a lot about that pretty coming up, um, because Assyria is, uh, the Assyrian culture is to, just to the northeast of the Jewish lands, and um, the some of the uh, some of the culture connects very very tightly with um, with with the family the family of Adam I'm not not Adam um, uh, Abraham 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 came from the Mesopotamian area so there's some Syrian influence there um, and then we have uh, pagan philosophy is is even the pagan philosophy is uh, is is, is uh, 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 one of the biggest sources for humanism, of course, uh, but it also gives us an excellent um, idea of the, the story of Jesus himself, because there are reflections of pagan philosophy in the things that Jesus taught to his, his own students, and even in the way that the method that he used, his methods were very similar to those of pagan philosophers. And so um, if he had been exposed to pagan philosophy, I would not be surprised. If he hadn't been exposed, I would be very surprised. Um, anyway, let's see. Um, one of the things I like to say is that there is no philosophy outside of the pagan tradition. That even even Jewish philosophy has has connections to pagan culture. Judaism is not isolated from pagan culture. Um, now, the Pauline the Pauline uh, tradition that the that the Catholic Church is based on is very much antithetical to pagan philosophy. And that is very unfortunate uh, for humanity and for the church itself. Um, although there are some parts of the church that are a little bit more sympathetic, such as the Jesuits, who seem to have a more of a sympathy for pagan uh, philosophy. All right. So, um, if are there any questions? Are there any questions? You can put them in the chat or just speak up. Otherwise, we'll move on to the next slide. The art, the artwork here is by a guy named, I believe it's a guy, Wael uh, Tarabia, and it's actually a more recent work. It was it was done in 1996. He did a whole series of artwork uh, illustrating the the um, the the, uh, the epic of Gilgamesh, which is a, a Mesopotamian uh, story that is very closely related to Jewish uh, the Jewish Genesis story. Um, and so, in, in this in this particular scene, we have uh, Enkidu on the left uh, fighting with Gilgamesh on the right, and um, the, so Enkidu is the, the horny boy. And one one of the things I like to say this 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 story of of the two the the bro the bromance between these two guys the, is is like a version of of Adam and Eve, but it, it's it's Adam and Steve instead of Adam and Eve. And um, it has a lot of things that are in common and has, shares a lot in common, tremendous amount of, in common with Genesis, including, including um, a flood, like a Noah-like flood character as well. Um, and, it, and it's a, it's a, a, a polytheistic uh, flood story, but it, it has, or not flood story, but the whole Genesis story, polytheistic Adam and Eve story. So it's not like a single deity, but if you look at the, if we look when we look at the Adam and Eve story a little bit more closely, we can see that there are some some polytheistic elements still left in it. Um, all right, so let's move on to the next slide. Slide six. Hey, slide six is up. All right, so um, uh, this is uh, the the more more about the Assyrian uh, perspective here. I mentioned the Gilgamesh parallels Genesis and Eden and the flood. Um, one of the interesting aspects of the, the story is that the, um, the the two heroes become impious or impious, as I should, I should say. Impious is not a, not the way it's supposed to be pronounced. They, so impiety is a is a result of the the, the wisdom and their and their journey um, and. Uh, this is something that shows up a lot. Impiety is something that shows up a lot in in the in the story of of Jewish history. There's a lot of there are a lot of um, of, of times when when Jewish people just they 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 get put off by their 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 lord their their you know master deity so to speak. Uh, another aspect of the of a, of the the story is that it's kind of it has a, a certain element of of a wisdom story where 
you you go you you go through the narrative and you get a certain impression from the narrative and then all of a sudden there's something in the story that is revealed in the story and it's a, there's a like a comment in the story that changes your perspective on the whole thing that makes you realize that certain aspects of the narrative that just that you had just gone through were not actually were, had a completely different understanding from a different perspective from an allegorical perspective so for example um, it's there is a there's a line where um, and Kidu is is uh, practiced in warfare so it makes you realize oh all of the things that had happened with Enkidu um, were things that were were aspects of warfare and not what they were and the, what they were how they showed up in the story so the, the story was sort of like an allegory for warfare um, and some other another thing that was very important here is that there's a magic herb for eternal life um, there's some there's a, uh, a lion slayer type of, of character or I'm sorry event that's a Gilgamesh is the lion slayer that shows up in in other um, the uh, lion slayer image shows up in, in other stories, especially in, in Greek culture. Um, there's a uh, temple construction that parallels uh, the Jewish history as well. Um, and then and the other thing is the mix of mortal and immortal. There's uh, there's a the the both uh, I believe both Gilgamesh and Enkidu are not purely mortal. That they have they have they're part god and part human. So they're sort of these these um, the marriage of the, the mortal and the immortal, and uh, that actually shows up in Genesis as well. You see the the the, the sons of the sons of God marry the the daughters of men, um, which is a and 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 give 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 birth to all kinds of, of interesting characters from from of old, so to speak, in the in the in the Genesis. Um, now it's in later in the Syrian culture I, I have a, the the fourth bullet item here the Syrians considered the deluge story of the story of the flood to be a metaphor for military invasion and that is something that shows up in 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 literature that surrounds the same the the, the Assyrian invasion that that intersected with uh, with uh Israel where it where the nine tribes of the northern kingdom of Israel were what were basically inundated and washed away by the Assyrian invasion, leaving only the two tribes uh, of Judah and Benjamin in the south. Um, so they, and the, 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 you have the, the inundation is in the, in the last bullet, bullet item here, Yahweh, the, it was the Assyrian deity of inundation. Uh, and Yahweh is, is very similar, is a very similar word to the name, the Jewish god Yahweh. Um, now, Assyrian art features winged creatures. I, I put the word heavenly in here. That should be in quotes. Um, they could also be considered hellish creatures, They're kind of ambiguous. They're uh, chimeric, chimeric creatures um, with different, different types of animals put together. Um, and then an, a, a, another item here that I should have put in was uh, tying this to Ezekiel because Ezekiel was a huge fan of this, the Assyrian Empire. And um, the, so, and, and he was also he also uh, has the imagery in the Ezekiel, the book of Ezekiel is also very similar with the similar types of of, of uh, chimeric um, beings, so to speak. Okay, slide seven is up. All right. So these these uh, sculptures had been excavated in uh, I believe they're from Nineveh, the, ex the Nineveh uh, archaeological dig. And these represent an ancient Assyrian um, uh, cherubim, cherubs. Um, they're, they're, you can see the chimeric uh, aspects of them. They have the bodies of, of oxen. They have heads of, heads of humans and wings of, of birds. And uh, the, the, the uh, Ezekiel's, uh, Ezekiel's chimera had something like that i don't know if the bodies i know they i believe they had the hooves of horses or something like that then but the heads were very different the heads were had the a human face uh an eagle an ox and a lion so they're all four different things um anyway and uh this is these are in the british museum it 
at this time. Uh, what else we have here? Um, there was also in Solomon's temple, it was said that there were, um, there were uh, cherubim in there as well with wings that, that connected, that practically touched each other. Um, now it's kind of interesting because there's there's something in the there's some bands in Jewish literature on on images and yet here they were images in the temple that were supposedly just fine which is kind of interesting. Um, let's see. Oh, there was a uh, in in the Davidic in the work the writings of or the Psalms of David King David. There's mention of the, David's deity riding on the back of a cherub. So there's, that's also a, a sort of a, a chimeric cherub, you know, that there, something can be ridden. Um, let's see. So the ox, the ox is tied in to, the, I mentioned the wild ox. One of the interesting things about the wild ox is that in the Septuagint, which was the Greek uh, translation of the Old Testament, of Jewish Old Testament going back centuries before Jesus, uh, the time of Ptolemy in, in, I think it was Ptolemy II in Alexandria, supposedly commissioned 70 rabbis to translate the, the their Jewish literature into Greek and that they all tr translated it exactly the same. That's a, 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 nobody actually believes that story. It's a, it's a nice fable. But uh, the, 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 that particular translation has all sorts of corruptions in it. So the word for wild ox was turned into a word that means something like unicorn or single horned animal, which probably indicated in, for the Alexandrians, uh, a, um, uh, I, would, I suspect it was a, would be a rhinoceros, something like that, which was the, 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 the similar type of something similar to, to wild cattle as, as far as strength goes. Um, now, another thing with, with cat, there are other things in cattle in Assyrian literature, there was in the story of Gilgamesh, there was a, a bull of heaven that came, that was sent down to try to to um, get Gilgamesh and Enkidu under control, and they defeated the, the bull of heaven, and, and uh, so... <clears throat> So you have that that uh, sort of like the Taurus, the Taurus, uh, or the the, the lunar um, cattle imagery, or the or the, the, the um, zodiac, Taurus zodiac. Anyway, uh, and the, um, there are other things in in some of the pagan literature about. Like, there's another thing about a cattle god. Uh, also, uh, in Kido himself, when he was we, when he was originally. Um, raised in the wilderness, he had hair like cattle. It was a, he was a shaggy guy, sort of kind of like a um, sort of like a Sasquatch or a, or a Yeti, you know. But then, but then the, he shaved in order to make himself more presentable to civilized society. Anyway, uh, we can move on to the next slide. Okay, slide eight. All right. So Jewish philosophy. Solomon. Solomon is probably the the, the peak of of Jewish philosophy, and I, I really really appreciate uh, the the Proverbs, the Book of Proverbs. There's some stuff in there that I use all the time in when I when I talk with Christians on trying to get them to get them to study philosophy, to be more serious about philosophy. Um, it's, it's like that they, they don't they they. Their their Pauline aversion to philosophy is is um, is rather off putting. Anyway, so uh, Solomon's mother was Bathsheba, who uh, for anybody who knows anything about the story of of King David, he he slept with one of his general's wives, who was Bathsheba, and then he had the general killed. So he, David took he, took her as a, as his own wife via sinister means. It was, it was a very embarrassing story for the the the, the, the heroism of King David. Um, now the story the, the the stuff of Solomon and David are, are probably mostly legendary. Um, on, on the upside of Solomon was was his exhortation to his children. That's the the book of Proverbs uh, to to pursue uh, wisdom and scholarship. Uh, on the downside, we have polygamy. He had a lot of wives. 
Uh, child abuse, uh, that's, child abuse is, is, is uh, my word for corporal punishment. Um, other, pe- other people agree with me that corporal punishment is a form of child abuse. Uh, it's one of the wa- ways where, where Jewish uh, philosophy differs considerably from pagan philosophy. Uh, pagan philosophers were almost uniformly opposed to uh, corporal punishment. They considered it to be uh, something that the way that, that slaves are treated, if you treat your kids like a slave, they'll become like slaves. Um, another downside of, of Solomon's reign was heavy taxation and the opulence of his palace. Um, the taxation issue became a big – that became a boiling point um, for his successors, and it led to the, the dissolution of the, of the kingdom into two, two competing kingdoms, the northern and southern kingdoms. Now, the, an, an interesting mythos about Solomon was that he gained his wisdom through prayer. And this is a major theme in fundamentalism, and it shows up in some of the, the New Testament literature as well. If you want, if you lack wisdom, then you pray for it. Um, that that is a uh, I, I seriously doubt that anybody has ever achieved any significant wisdom through prayer. Um, now I, I mentioned here that the individual is a metaphor for the body politic. This is sort of a, a glimpse into pagan philosophy. Uh, the, the, it's not as prevalent in Jewish philosophy, but you do see it in the sense of the, like the term Israel. Israel is the body politic of, of, the, of the nation of Israel, um, but it's, Israel is also the name of Jacob. Jacob's name is Israel. So Jacob became the, the founder of the entire, the entire body politic. Um, and then we have the Song of Solomon. Now that is, from what I've, I've gleaned from early Christian literature, of which was pre- predated the Nicene Council, um, that it was the, the the origin of the apple in the in the story of the Garden of Eden. So the, what happened there was that some uh, there was a, uh, a, a theologian uh, who drew a parallel between the the brides the the brides. Uh, garden in the Song of Solomon, and the garden in the uh, in Eden, the Garden of Eden, and there are apples growing in the in the bride's garden. So you have apples, the apple in the Garden of Eden. Um, that's it was a sort of a it's kind of a of a uh, inter- interesting way of treating that particular uh, biblical book because it is it is it is a really racy piece of literature. It's very erotic. It's a it's a wedding it's a wedding um, song sort of it's but it's more of a song it's almost like a it's almost like a, a piece of theater and uh, it has some really hokey imagery in it but it, it's it's still um, it, it's still kind of has kind of delightful in a way and and the eroticism I'm, I'm sure was a bit of an embarrassment to some of the some of the early uh, Christian uh, theologians because they're they're sensibilities for eroticism were not that great. Um, now, one of the things I, I put here is that the prophets, the Jewish prophets, uh, were, were like, they were like proto-philosophers. They were, they, they shared a lot in common with, the, with pagan philosophers, uh, and there was sort of like a school of prophets, just like there were a school of philosophers, and um, the, the the, you know, being, being having this having this, this this supposed connection to some you know cosmic creator deity um, was a uh, was their that was their that was their forte. But on the other hand, they also they also had, were uh, very good at, at wordsmithing and things like that. And they had they had um, they were they were well educated in in rhetoric and in and in poetry and they had they had a um sort of a of a uh, of a uh, an aesthetic uh, aesthetic <laughs> so to speak so they 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 practiced they they tr- they tried to to not be opulent they tried to not be to not take bribes or anything like that and they tried to to be as as uh, as upright as possible, so that they that they would be they have a certain amount of credibility, which is something that you see in pagan philosophy. Um, 
now, by modern standards, the, the, the prophets would be considered to be uh, uh, victims of psychosis, the sufferers of psychosis, for, for hearing, hearing the, the, the voice of a, of a cosmic creator deity, and, and also for seeing visions. Um, and and, and, and in, in ancient standards, by ancient standards, uh, they, they would have been considered to be possessed by demons, and uh, some, of the, some of the things that they're their their deity the the things that were asked of the Jewish people by their their cosmic creator deity were 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 by modern standards and by ancient standards were not pleasant and they were not they were not nice and 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 the, and their their comments about Jews considering the the deity to be an evil deity and it, it certainly comes across that way urging them to commit horrific acts of of, um, of genocide. Anyway, if we can move on, any questions about that? We can move on to the next slide. Okay, slide nine. All right, now this artwork is um, by a guy named Edward Pointer from the late uh, 19th century. This is King Solomon receiving the Queen of Sheba. And um, so Sheba was smitten by Solomon. She was, she lost her spirit. She was, she was, uh, her bubble was burst, so to speak. Um, and oh, the one, the one, one aspect of of the the Solomonic uh, philosophy that 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 I find distasteful is his his uh, spare the rod uh, philosophy. He also he he also uh, favors beating. Eating fools as well. I mean, it's it's, it's, a, it's a bit bit sadistic if you ask me. Um, but the the spare one of the things I like to say about spare the rod is to to look at it a as a, a allegorically it means a it means a fishing rod, right? Because a fishing rod teaches patience. <laughs> And then there's the other one is a measuring rod, measuring measure measure your children as you as you're raising them. Um, Anyway, so there, the the uh, pagan philosophers uh, did, did not approve of that form of, of child rearing, and, uh, and and preached against it, and quite quite adamantly. Anyway, so we can move on to the next. Okay, slide ten. All right. So some of the things that. You encounter in pagan philosophy that are that are informative of Jewish philosophy as well, or Jewish culture as well. Uh, the, typically, a pagan priesthood would embody knowledge that was t that had been passed on from an original cult figure. So, the, the priests of Apollo had been founded by had been started by a, some guy named Apollo, and they probably picked up more information, more stuff along the way, along the generations, but the original, the original founding material was, was by, by a human being. And then, and then there's the, the, the apotheosis of the cult figure, which is the apotheosis means to, to lift up to the gods. So the, the cult figure would go up into the heavens and join, and join the gods. So Apollo would be up there in, in the sky, um, even though he was, even though he had been a human being. Uh, so sort of a a um, a what, what's sort of a demigod demigod, and there are all kinds of things in pagan literature about apotheosis. There was one thing of, there was there was one particular story where a guy was they they wanted to elevate him to the to the heavens and give him a seat in the heavens, and he did not want that because he said that that means that somebody else, some other member of the pantheon would have to come back down to earth and that would wreak havoc on humanity. And, and and that actually made him even more that desire to not be be, be put into the into the heavens made him even a, a stronger candidate for apotheosis. <laughs> kind of ironic. Um, so another thing you see in in uh, Greek imagery is the 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 Apollo. There's a, a scene in in uh, the the Iliad where Apollo is uh, sowing pestilence into the Greek military, the ranks of the, and the, the animals of the Greek military with silver arrows. And um, uh, this is a, um, it's, it's a, it's something that has a, uh, a, a, a real life um, 
some a real life ex- explanation. It's not necessarily a, 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 a cosmic uh, divine intervention, but but an actual a real life actual uh, kind of so- sowing the seeds of pestilence that shows up later on. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped the uh, sacred imagery as metaphor. Um, the the this is the 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 uh, Pauline Church. The Pauline theologians ridicule ridicule the the pagan philosophers for allegorizing their 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 deities, and uh, but the, 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 that's the way it was meant to be in the first place. If they were originally meant, there something is originally meant as metaphor. Then that metaphor is the way you you should interpret them. And it's, they're it's, they're not being they're not being you know demean and degraded it's, it's just a better understanding of what the what the what the original poets meant when they when they when they spoke of the of the the deities so to speak um let's see now another thing is that the use of the individual is a metaphor for the body politic i mentioned this with israel it's even more more fleshed out in in the pagan philosophy where um you have the ideas you have terms like the head, you have the head of the body politic, the hand of the body politic, the finger of the hand of the body politic, um, and then and then likewise you can have the same kind of things with uh, the divine hand as well. That's another thing that comes up, and the, the divine finger. Um, so and, and like a, a hand and an, an, a hand will show up in a in a, a story where you all you see is just the hand, and that hand represents the, an individual who themselves is basically just a hand of the of the entire body politic. They're not the they're 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 not really they're they're connected to the head somehow, but not that maybe not maybe indirectly so to speak. Um, Animal icons are used in in uh, pagan philosophy to represent sexual practices. So the the most the classic example of that is uh, the use of waterfowl to represent monogamy, and uh, something that shows up in Plato, where the, we create a myth that that um, human sexuality is like a, is like a, a, a duck, and they they mate once and for life, and. and is the strict uh, monogamy, uh, but there are also other also other animal symbols uh, for sexual practices. Uh, uh, some, so, so for example, a cat. Some 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 uh, practices are associated with cats. The same, same because cats are more pr- promiscuous, so to speak. Those who are promiscuous more cat-like. Um, let's see. Logos is a big logos is a big thing in pagan philosophy. And logos shows up in in Christian literature as well, but the Christians uh, have a tendency to uh, to corrupt the idea of logos uh, horrifically. And I'll get into that later. But logos um, me- means two things in Greek: one is reason, and the other is oratory. Um, I'll get into that a little bit more in more detail later. Uh, and then, of course, we have the Gnostics, who are um, the Gnostics are basically the intersection of pagan philosophy and um, and and the Christian tradition. They're 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 not considered Gnostics are not considered Christians by the Christians because they don't accept the Trinity. They're not they're non-Trinitarian, but um, they, they have they preserve a, a body of literature that shows a. a, a Probably much more respect for Jesus and more respect for the things that Jesus taught than the than uh, than does the body of Christian literature, which is mostly oriented towards worshiping Jesus and not actually learning from what he says. Um, now, the John Burens did a did a, a wonderful series on the Gnostics, um, I guess about two years ago, and uh, I really appreciated his his treatment of it. And he's very sympathetic with the Gnostics. There are a lot of other, a lot of other um, uh, uh, more modern theologians who, have, who are kind of reconsidering the Gnostics as not so bad after all, which is good to see. Um, so, if we have any questions? We can move on to the next slide. Slide eleven. What's that? Slide eleven is up. Alrighty, great.
Now, this is an this is an example of a of artwork depicting apotheosis. This is the apotheosis of the Medici, and it's a 17th century artwork. Very very similar. It was re, it was very similar to a, a work, the apotheosis of Washington, on the the ceiling of the Capitol in Washington, which was imitated this particular work of art with a lot more a lot more characters, more 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 things in it. Um, so this shows the the reintroduction of the idea of apotheosis during Renaissance, the Renaissance period, um, and um, the, the the individual being lifted up to the gods. Now the Medici, of course, were they were rather um, I don't know <laughs> they're they're kind of capitalist pigs. So <laughs> considering them to be to be divine is was a was a probably a good way to sell a painting, you know, patrons of the arts. All right, so let's move on to um, the next slide. Slide 12. All righty. Now, uh, these are some of the contemporaries of Jesus that are sort of, some, some of them are pretty well considered by by Christian theologians, but others are are not, especially the Essenes. The Essenes um, they had a they had a, a, a monastery on the Dead Sea in in Qumran, and um, they, the 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 Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered fairly recently, and um, an amazing cache of literature. Um, there's some. There's a lot of apocryphal literature that is that is actually a scene literature. There's a the Book of Tobit, for example, is a, is an Essene book, um, and then there is also the, the, the Therapeutae are described by Philo of Alexandria, who's in the second uh, bullet item there. They were not located. They were not associated with the Essenes, but they they seem to be like Essenes. They seem to be very similar to the Essenes. Um, they, they were lo they had a monastery in um, just south of Alexandria, uh, Lake Mariotis, I believe it's, it's it was in in um, northern Egypt, and um, they're very very similar to the Essenes. Um, the 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 Essenes were had some connections to the um, to the zealots who were very much involved in the rebellion against Rome in the, toward the end of the first century. But they, uh, there is this, in the, the Dead Sea Scrolls include a lot of, a lot of things that, that resonate with the story of Jesus, including the idea of, of a savior having, um, having 12, 12 judges of one for each tribe of Israel and a, a, um, an executive committee of, of three people, which is which is also reflected in the New Testament. So there are a lot of there are a lot of things that that uh, that are very close between the Essenes and the the um, the, the work of the, the the mission of Jesus and the work of Jesus and his followers. The common property is another aspect that they shared in common as well. There's a one of the things that the, the Pauline tradition tries to do. Desperately is to dissociate the uh, Jesus and and John the Baptist from the Essenes altogether, but it's that's very difficult to do because there's so much similarity there. It's almost impossible to 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 take take them take them apart. Um, the next bullet item, Philo of Alexandria, is a uh, was a, uh, a a direct contemporary of Jesus. He was very active right at the time that that Jesus was teaching and. Um, he uh, did a pretty good job of syncretizing the Jewish and pagan tradition. He mentions Logos himself. Uh, he was a student of, of pagan philosophy. Um, so that was something that that uh, a lot of uh, seemed to be pagan philosophy seemed to be uh, appealed to a lot of, of Jewish intellectuals. Um, another another contemporary is a bit later than Jesus, but similar time period is Josephus. And he was a Jewish historian with a Pharisee background. He also he spent a little bit of time with the Sadducees and the and the the Essenes. So he gives a little bit of of comparison there between them and the Pharisees. Um, let's see. Uh, I mentioned Homer's Apollo, uh, so in pestilence in the Greek army. Uh, the idea there is that at, at the time 
of Jesus, that was considered to be an allegory. And that, um, so that, that was considered those, that, that it wasn't, that wasn't actually Apollo who was, was sowing the pestilence. It was, it was some, some, the, the, uh, people at the behest of the priests of the, of, of, of Apollo. Um, let's see now the cynics, the cynics were a, um, they're, they're, I, I put them down here as the cult of Diogenes. They had a lot in common with the Essenes. They had a lot of common in common with Jesus and his teachings. Uh, they they taught uh, they taught a similar type of of um, abstaining from violence. They would refrain from violence, sort of turning the other cheek kind of thing. But they taught it with a they taught it with a reason. They put the reason behind it. Now Jesus did too. Jesus taught his students the reason behind his teachings, uh, but not all of that was has been written down. A lot of it was, it was mostly oral, and um, very little of it was written down. I think the only one where the reason is actually elucidated is in the story of the seed sower. Um, but, but that gives you an idea that Jesus actually did teach the reason, reason behind the, the, the ideas. So turning the other cheek, the reason that the cynics give for turning the other cheek is that uh, the, if somebody is behaving violently towards you, then if you, the best way to deal with them is to treat them as if they were a child. And because to a certain extent, that's what they are relative to a philosopher. Somebody who has no philosophic training is, 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 is pretty much like, like a childlike adult. And they're, they're being violent in the way that children are being violent. So you wouldn't treat a child, uh, you wouldn't react to a child with violence. Um, so don't react to a violent person with violence, and and, and in fact, being being nonviolent is is a is a very very um, it's one of the, the biggest power tools in the in the belt of the of the philosopher, and we we we've, we've seen that in, in in recent times with Gandhi and other nonviolent resistance work. Uh, let's see. Now, Diogenes himself was a, a houseless philosopher. Uh, I, I don't like to use the term homeless. He, he had a home. He didn't have a house. Um, and he was a, a, a countercultural figure. Uh, he was. He did really nasty things like masturbating in public. But uh, there were some other some other delightful stuff in his story, like his encounter with uh, with Alexander the Great, which is which is really a, really a hoot. It's kind of interesting because Alexander the Great was said to have been have been uh, uh, sired by Zeus, and that that uh, so that his his mother was was had been had been um, impregnated by Zeus rather than Philip his father. So uh, so Diogenes said that that he had a reputation for being a bastard because because his, his because uh, Philip wasn't his real father. His real father was Zeus. <laughs> was this kind of cute? And so you have that. This is a very similar kind of thing with the Holy Spirit impregnating Mary to be to, to form Jesus. Um, and let's see. Now the Stoics. There weren't as many cynics at the time of Jesus. They they did exist, but they're the biggest uh, sub subgroup of this. The spinoff of the of the cynics were the Stoics, and a lot of Stoics uh, went on to become, or a lot of the I should not the Stoics, but a lot of the Christian theologians um, were had been dropouts from the Stoic school, so there was a there was a, a, a strong uh, tendency for Stoics to, to to join the the Christian the early Christian Church before the Nicene Council. Um, okay, are if there are any questions? Any if there aren't any questions, we can move on to the next slide. Okay, this is slide thirteen. All right. So this is a uh, an image of the the Qumran monastery as it is now. Um, it's, it was it was destroyed uh, probably by the Romans during the first Jewish rebellion in the first century. Um, I suspect that that the some of their literature had been discovered in the in a um, the Masada Masada um, fortress which was a zealot fortress that one of the last holdouts of the zealots during the, the Jewish revolt. And uh, I suspect that the, that the, the Pharisees pointed out that the, the, that, that literature that they found was, was a scene literature and, and that prompted the, the, the Romans to, uh, 
destroy the monastery. That's my own speculation. It's probably it may 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 not be the case, but in in any case, they they were uh, pretty much wiped out, and um, their literature was found stashed in caves down. You can see there's like a there's a they're up on a bluff above the Dead Sea. There you can see the the, the down at the bottom of the image. You can see the the slope of the bluff, but down in there. Along the slope there, there were they found there were some caves were discovered, and the their literature was discovered in the caves. Um, now there, it's it's really fascinating. There was a, I recently encountered a story of some guy named Hegesippus, uh, who was a a Jewish uh, a Jewish Christian who told the story about uh, James the Just, and James the Just was supposedly a brother of Jesus. Uh, who had basically taken over? He, James, Peter, and John formed the executive committee after the the, the crucifixion of Jesus, and that James was also was called James the Just. And Hegesippus portrays him as an Essene, and the the Pauline were like the Pauline commentators are like, oh no, this must be wrong because he wasn't in the scene; he couldn't have been in the scene. And there's there's absolutely nothing that I've seen that would that would Make make anybody believe that that was that that was the case. As, as far as I could tell, he, he probably wasn't a scene, and and I, I suspect Jesus had a scene associations as well. Um, now the the Dead Sea the Dead Sea was called the the Sea of Arabah back in the day, uh, and I I wonder if Arabah had a, has any relation to the name Arab. That may, it may be a connection there. Uh, it's also called the Salt Sea. Uh, it, the 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 monastery was only about a day's walk from where John the Baptist was su- supposedly uh, baptizing people on the River Jordan for, further north, um, and uh, one of the things they had that's that's featured in the monastery is a mikveh, which is a, a ritual uh, bathtub uh, for ritual bathing. That because the Essenes were into ritual bathing, so there is there is a connection there between Essene ritual bathing and the, the ritual bathing of, of baptism by John the Baptist, and and I would I would say that any, that the, the the likelihood of John the Baptist being is being in the scene is pretty strong. He, he, he comes across he, he comes across as the, an excellent example of somebody who would have been in the scene back in that time. All right, so let's move on to the next slide. Okay, slide 14. All right, so Jesus and allegory. Now, al- allegory, the, some of the, the, the Pauline uh, theologians really hate it when people allegorize certain things. Some things, it's okay, it's okay to allegorize the Song of Solomon because it's a sexy, it's a sexy uh, uh, erotic uh, uh, work of literature, but don't allegorize anything that has anything to do with Jesus or with, the, with Genesis. Um, there was a, a theologian named Origen uh, who got in trouble for for exactly that reason. But Jesus was the master of the metaphor. So you have somebody who's using metaphor. Allegory is all about metaphor. So I would I would say that 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 if his if his followers didn't use metaphor, then they didn't really learn anything from. Him. <laughs> Anyway, um, now you have metaphor. You have the metaphor of the fisher of fishers of men. Um, there's there's a there's an allusion there to the to the deluge or the flood. Um, the, it, you know, thinking of the the deluge in an allegorical way. Uh, there was a there was a, an early Christian named Barnabas who taught. Um, he had a, a subscribed to allegorical interpretation of the dietary laws from Genesis. So you have, and he was more of a student of the of the apostles than uh, Paul uh, was. Um, Paul learned very little from the apostles themselves. Um, and let's see. Uh, so the, the other thing is there was a, a the dietary liberalism. Um, the the apost the, the the Paul was instructed that the the to not was that the, the, he wanted the he would the executive committee uh, John uh, James and Peter wanted him to have the the Gentile Christians abstain from uh, eating consuming blood and um, consuming anything that's sacrificed to an idol 
and consuming things that are strangled. So the, those, that was the limit of the dietary restrictions placed on Gentiles, and it may also have been similar to some dietary liberalism practiced uh, by the, the apostles themselves. Um, uh, even even uh, Jesus made a comment about corruption doesn't come from corruption comes from within rather than rather than what you what you take what you eat what you what you're eating. So, it, the 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 quote of a quote of Jesus' own teaching in the in the Gospels showed that he was more of a dietary liberalist than a than a strict orthodox uh, uh, dietary rule person. Um, Another aspect of Jesus and, and, and allegory comes from the reduction of the commandments from 10 to 2 and the change from prohibitive to prescriptive. So the Ten Commandments, he, he basically boiled down to the, the Ten Commandments to just um, love, uh, love the, your, your God and uh, love your neighbor as yourself. So it's prescribing something rather than prohibiting something. So the re the rest of the commandments you don't really need to worry about. Um, although it, th what happens is if you if you love your neighbor you won't sleep with your neighbor's wife so you don't have to worry about you don't have to worry about coveting <laughs> your neighbor's wife, right? Anyway, um, let's see. Uh, another thing he 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 urged compassion for children. Um, this doesn't really have to do with allegory, but it does. It does have to do with the repeal of the spare the rod attitude um, and, and a more of a pagan attitude toward child rearing um, rather than than uh, now there is a something I recently encountered uh, that could, could be used to contradict that where uh, there was some Buddhist Buddhist monks commenting on a on a, a story about a, about a Buddhist master beating a, a monk with a with a stick. And saying that the, the commentators were saying that the master had such great compassion for, for the monk that he was beating. <laughs> so, so compassion, compassion can be can be um, t taken in, a, in an upside down way if it's if, if the need if the need arises. Anyway, so look, could we move on to the slide fifteen. Hey, slide fifteen. All right. Actually, we should I should pick up the pace here. Um, I don't have the I don't have the art credit for this, but it, I think it's an in, interesting. It's a co conflation of two different two different stories. The in the in the New Testament, you have the fisher, the the the, the apostles in the boat, and Jesus walking on the water, um, and then Jesus is all lit up. And the 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 lit, the lit up part is actually taken from the story of the Transfiguration, which is Jesus on a mountaintop with John, Peter, and um, James and, and somehow being being all trans, transfigured and, and lit up like that. Um, the, but the what, one of the interesting things about walking on water is that it's, it appeals more to, to the to the pa pagans than it does to the Jews. Uh, walking on water shows up in, in a couple of different pagan stories. One is Orion walking on water, and the other one is uh, Serapis walking on water. Um, now this could be considered an allegory for having there, there is some a, 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 a water association with logos so there might be a logos reference here I don't know but um, anyway so it, uh, th if, you, if any, anybody takes this literally then uh, you know good luck with that uh, <laughs> yeah, so we move on to the next slide slide 16 all right so these are some of the connections between Judaism and, and pagans. Um, Abraham was associated with the Chaldeans. He grew up in, in the Chaldean, amidst the Chaldeans, and they were pagans. Um, and there, there are two different Chaldeans. There are the ethnic Chaldeans, and then there's Chaldean philosophers. The Chaldean philosophers were kind of like um, magi. Um, it's very possible that Abraham had some a connection with the Chaldean philosophers himself. Um, Let's see. Circumcision is has a pagan connection in Egypt uh, with the Egyptian priesthood being circumcised. Uh, let's see. Jewish literature typically reflects henotheism rather than monotheism. There are mentions of multiple gods. There are mentions of ch uh, multiple children, multiple sons of gods. Uh, 
um, there, the the uh, even the story of the Garden of Eden. There's a there's a plurality there. The word Elohim is is a plural word in in, um, in Hebrew. Um, let's see, Jews the, the Jews outgrew their aversion to pagan culture. Um, there there are certain th certain pagan things that are acceptable and some that are not. So pagan philosophy is fine, but pagan worship or or pagan ritual is not. Pagan ritual is is, is a no no. But that's fine because the pagan philosophers themselves were not that big on on the sacrificing to the gods either. Um, let's see, Assyrian literature, uh, which I talked about. That's pagan connection. Uh, the Jewish aversion to idolatry is also reflected in Zoroastrian, in the Zoroastrian tradition. Um, the Zoroastrians uh, ridiculed the Greeks for locking the gods up in temples. Um, the, that was, they, they were opposed to having uh, Im images of the gods at all, in fact. Um, so they shared that with, with, the, with the Jews. Uh, and then, of course, there's the, the Zoroastrian um, political connection with the restoration of the, of the Jewish people to Jerusalem after the Babylonian captivity. Um, let's see. There, there's a there, there are a lot of there's a lot of humanism in um, in the the in Jewish divinity, especially when you have angels showing up as human beings in the story of, of Abraham and Jacob and wrestling with an angel and things like that. Um, and then, of course, the the mortal immortal proximity in Genesis that I mentioned before. Um, all right. So now, another thing about the deluge that uh, that shows an allegorical an allegorical origin is the the fact that there were some there were some entities that existed before the flood, and that still existed after the flood, and that such as the offspring of the the marriage between the sons of God and the and the daughters of men. So they weren't they weren't wiped out by the flood. So that shows that think considers the flood as allegorical. So let's go to the next slide. A slide 17. All right, and here we have an an, an image, an, a painting by Simon de Mille, Noah's Ark on Mount Ararat from the 16th century. And uh, from an allegorical perspective, the animals um, the animals are are reflected in animal heraldry in the ancient world. So if you think of the the, the animals not as being as being um, actual animals, but as being political entities, and you think of it as a from the the same um, political uh, uh, inundation story as the the Assyrians, then the, then it makes more sense that way. Um, and it, it's a better it's a better fit it makes for a better fit. Um, and you see Delu stories in not just in the, the Assyrian literature, also in the Chaldean literature, Babylonian. There was a Babylonian priest that had a flood story. Um, there were flood stories in pagan culture and also Native American. There was a Native American flood story as well. It's hard to say whether that Native American story was, was or was not introduced by intersection with uh, Viking culture, for example, um, before, the, before the Christian invasion. Of North America. Yeah, so let's move on to the next slide. Okay, slide into. All right. So, uh, Jesus and the pagans, uh, the Platonic ideas are reflected in the teaching of Jesus. So, for example, uh, the idea of rendering unto G unto Caesar that which is Caesar's. Is is a reflection of the Socratic idea of justice, where you give each person their due. You give Jesus what you give the Caesar what his his due is. You give God what his due is, and you give Jesus what his due is. Uh, anyway, uh, let's see. I mentioned the cynics um, and how their lifestyle is intersects with the the, the Essenes. Um, the, the structure, the esoteric exoteric structure that's that's portrayed in the Gospels, with like the seed sower paradigm, uh, where you have the, the 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 parable goes is the ex the exoteric, and then the esoteric is the meaning behind the parable. That's something that that the Pythagoreans technique the Pythagoreans used. Um, 
pagan ideas are in, in more reflected in the Johannine and the Gnostic literature. Johannine literature being um, the Gospel of John and the also the Revelation. Revelation has uh, some aspects of some things in it that seem to be more more in line with the with the pagan uh, tradition than than with um, traditional uh, Pharisaic tradition. Um, let's see the pagan logos, reason and oratory, which is in the Johannine literature. The, the, John, the, the book of John, John's gospel begins, opens up with, in the beginning was logos, and logos was with God, and logos was God, and that word logos has has been has been corrupted in, in the Pauline tradition in, in, in rather nasty ways. Um, let's see, and then I mentioned the Pauline attempt to credit. Um, Moses, the credit Moses with the pagan ideas. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. Um, it's it's very possible that Jesus studied. Um, excuse me. <coughs> Jesus studied with um, uh, pagan. Had some pagan influence in the town of Sepphoris. Sepphoris was a cosmopolitan city that was well, sub semi city, small city. That was close to Nazareth. It would have been the best place for a um, a young um, a young carpenter to, to ply his trade, or a young construction worker to ply his trade. Um, let's see. And another thing, another connection is that pagan philosophers admired Jesus, but they hated the apostles. <laughs> they thought the apostles were losers, but they thought Jesus was a swell guy. All right. So okay, let's go on to the next slide. Slide 19, sorry. All right, so let's see. Uh, this is a an image of the of logos. This is a, a a classic logos image. It's not not really. I mean, it's actually just a spring of water uh, with a stream flowing from it. But this is how the philosophers, pagan philosophers, represented logos. So the spring of water itself represents reason, the reason component of logos. And then the stream of water represents the oratory that flows from it. And um, that's deep. I'm going to have to get some water here. So um, what, some of the ways that Logos has been corrupted uh, by the, in the Pauline tradition, um, for one thing, they define the Logos as Jesus, and Jesus is Logos. It's one of the reasons, one, probably one of the reasons Paul wanted people to stay away from the 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 pagan philosophy is because they they find out that logos predated Jesus. <laughs> anyway, so um, uh, another thing they do is they they've changed it. They they've corrupted it. Uh, we see it in English as word. It was corrupted into Latin as verbum, and then into English as word. So the, a lot of the the original meaning has been lost. Um, and then, then there's other things like the claim that that Jesus was born embodying the logos rather than embodying the logos over you know over time. Um, let's see. Now another aspect of the, in the in the uh, other aspect of the of John's gospel is that is that nothing nothing is made without the logos. And if you think about it. Everything that human beings make, there's an element of reason in everything that humans make, including including idols. There is there is a there is a reason why people have fashioned idols, and so so uh, even the 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 the, uh, the the hatred of of idols and idolatry runs counter to the idea that everything that that, that, that there's logos behind everything, you know, even the things that people hate. All right. Um, one of the things I like to say is that there is no such thing as uninspired art, and there's there's there is there is there is logos inspiration in 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 all works of art, even some of the, even some of the most pathetic, <laughs> even the, even the uh, the the C movie, the condemned movies. Well, the condemned movies are usually better than the the B movies. The, even the B movies have some some element of logos, some element of inspiration. All right, so can we move on to the next slide? Slide 20. All right, so what went wrong? Uh, well, the medieval church was founded by Paul the Pharisee and not by Jesus. 
Jesus warned about against putting new wine in old wineskins, and Paul was certainly an old wineskin. Uh, I like I refer to the I refer to the the Pauline uh, orthodoxy as the the sour vinegar of orthodoxy. Um, Jesus divided his own students. There are divisions between the apostles and the disciples, and then there's divisions within the apostles and di- with divisions within the disciples. Now, most of the apostles were, were disciples. Some of them were not so good at it, and some of them were better than others. Um, the, the, the apostles themselves had a more of a security role than a discipleship role. Uh, the followers, the followers of Paul, persecuted the the, the genuine students. They were considered heretics because they had a deeper understanding of the things that Jesus taught. Um, let's see. Now, there's a fundamentalist seal. You have the seal of the 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 the, the, of the obscurity of the Bible itself, but there's also the seal of fundamentalist mind, which is sealed um, against being an open mind. Uh, and then we have um, various textual corruptions, uh, faulty allegoriz- faulty allegorization. Uh, in addition to that, there's also the denial of common property, which is something that the, that the, the early Christians practiced. There's uh, the, the Paul Paul was, didn't didn't wasn't really a, a champion of the poor until until the, the he had a meeting with the apostles and they pointed out that he needed to needed to pay more attention to the poor. Um, there's the uh, Pauline, uh, the Pauline tendency uh, to to depend on affluent people for donations makes that makes it more acceptable for people to be affluent, and so they support they support uh, they're more likely to support um, uh, sinister behavior by the by the affluent to get richer. All right, next one, next slide. Slide twenty one. So this is my this is my view of Paul Paul the Pharisee here, <laughs> the wolf in sheep's clothing. He was a um, he was a member of the tribe of Benjamin, and the tribe of Benjamin was Benjamin was supposed to be a a, a, a ravening wolf. So um, so there, there you have a connection between the ravening, ravening wolf and Paul. Um, now the wolf the wolf has had some interesting other interesting aspects to it. The wolf imagery was used uh wolf was used as a Celt the wolf howl was used as a Celtic battle cry in the, the invasion of Rome back in something like the third century before Jesus. And um the, the in the West a wolf was a, a term for a harlot because a uh, you see the a a, a a woman who was in dire straits would uh, approach a, a shepherd and exchange sexual favors for one of the sheep. And so then the shepherd would go back to the owner of the flock and tell him that the sheep had been taken by a wolf. So the prostitutes were associated with wolves by that because of that. Um, anyway, um, now we can move on to the next slide. Slide so done. So these are my proposed solutions. Uh, Gnostic revival is a is uh, is one. That's a, there's a certain amount of Gnostic revival already in the works, but the more the merrier, the more the better. Um, what what I advocate for a Gnostic revival would would also include uh, modern, modern math, female education, herbal knowledge, um, and then the the relegation of the of the more magical aspects of the Gnostics to, to be just for entertainment so that they were into numerology and uh, I'm not a big fan of numerology that they also, they've also had probably had a little bit of astrology going on there too. And this, astrology is okay for entertainment, but not, not for anything serious. Um, uh, the, there is a, there's some significant Johannine stories in the Grimm collection that are very uh, very fascinating. The Grimm collection has some they're probably left over from a medieval uh, Gnostic revival. Um, let's see, called Paul, Pauline culty programming, um, leveraging the Johannine logos and and how it's been corrupted by the church, emphasizing the stale vinegar of orthodoxy. One of my favorite expressions underscoring the, the Pauline errors in history, including the, 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 their advocacy of a flattened the mobile earth, um, denouncing the, the Pauline use of violence, the, the, they, the way that they violently persecuted um, heretics, um, and also the, the idea of spiritual maternity. 
um, Mother Earth, Mother Nature, alma mater, wisdom as a as a as a maternal entity. Um, the, these are these are counter to the to the the male only domination of, of the Pauline tradition. Um, and the other another aspect is that. Uh, Paul, uh, the the Gnostics of the time of Paul pointed out that even even Paul used Gnostic terms, and there's some people that say that that the church has Gnostic elements built into it. But a lot of the terms that were used, like the the Omoousius, which is a co- the translated into co- consubstantial, it was a Gnostic term that that was used rather rather heavy handedly, ham handedly by the Pauline tradition. Uh, a lot of there are a lot of uh, monogenies. Mon- monogenesis is, was a Gnostic idea, and that was adapted into the Pauline terminology as well. But they use it in a very different way. Um, anyway, uh, another thing is that um, in the, another thing that that, it, that I, I favor is a is a an opening up of an accept more of ex- acceptance of herbal remedies by uh, by physicians, and that's that's a, there are some physicians who are more in, more accept more liberal in that regard than others. Um, the, the, the the herbal herbal knowledge um, it's it's a little tri- it's tricky because it because it's not you know we don't know as much about it as we do about the the pharmaceuticals but at the same time there there are some there are some benefits some some of course there are detriments um but uh, the the idea of of having a, a mind opening um experience with hallucinogenic drugs is something that an awful lot of people have have um appreciated and and um and and favored for others to, to, to experience. All right, so uh, finally, last slide. This is a... Slide 23. All right, so this is just an image of, of a, uh, an apple tree. And this gets back to the original, uh, the original Garden of Eden, the apples. And I, I'd mentioned that, um, that uh, there was a, a, an interpretation, of, an allegorical interpretation of the Song of Solomon that um that where the apple is considered to be a reference to the apple tree in the garden is considered a reference to the garden of eden apple um but of course the the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil is is definitely not an apple and it was that's one of the it's one of the the one of my favorite questions is what is what is the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil and the, the best answer I, I heard I've gotten is from a friend of mine who said that it's a uh, it's a metaphor. Yes, it's an obvious metaphor, but it's what is it a metaphor for? And um, anyway, so, so there are certain aspects about the story that are very counter to Christian to current Christian theology. Um, the, it's, it's an earthly paradise. It's a, the, the, they are earthly uh, entities. Um, they are. There, 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 there is, there's a metaphor there. There's a metaphor also for the snake. A talking snake is clearly another metaphor of the talking animal stuff, of the, the pagan world. Um, and then you, you could even say that uh, Adam and Eve themselves are metaphors, and even the gods themselves are metaphors, or the god, the one god that was, was originally more than one god, uh, is, is a, are metaphors as well. Um, and so if you see if you see the story as being very metaphoric and very earth and and de- very down to earth then it's and it's a completely different story than 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 what is way it's viewed from cr- traditional christian um theology uh the the only difference between adam and eve and the other and the gods themselves is is the is eternal life and you know the w- one of the things that we that we know from science is that that everything participates in, in in eternal cycles. We're already we're already part of a larger eternal life. Um, we we contri- when we die our 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 when when animals die when we die when maybe not when we die but <laughs> we take ourselves out of the food chain. But the, you know there's like a cycle there's like a, a larger cycle of life. And and uh, and we all we all participate in the eternal in other ways. So we study mathematics to be um, to be closer to the people who invented mathematics and also to help us to solve eternal problems, the, pro- the, the problems that keep coming up generation after generation. Um, 
let's see. Uh, so gods are human-esque, human gods. Um, let's see. Oh yeah, the, and finally, the other thing was that the 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 herbal knowledge thing. The the way that I came up with a tie between herbal knowledge and the the, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, or the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, was because herbal knowledge had been banned uh, by a, um, uh, or it had, been, it had been purged. A book of herbal knowledge had been purged from a library of Hezekiah, and Hezekiah was a king of Judah at the time of the Assyrian invasion of, of Israel. Um, so, and, and herbal knowledge is still taboo today. So it, it has that, it has that quality of being, being a, a taboo knowledge that has both positive and negative aspects to it, that herbs can be used positively and negatively. And, um, it also, it, 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 you, it, consuming some of the, some herbs can be very, very mind opening experience, very eye opening experience in that, in, in that sense. So that's all I have. Any any questions? Okay. Uh, let me see. I see David's hands up. Just unmute yourself, David. Mute. Uh, yeah. I, I had a thanks, Bob. Uh, I had a few questions. Um, my impression. What? Let me, what tribal tradition did Jesus come from? I thought it was either Essenes or Sadducees or something like that. He didn't come from nothing. Tribal tribal tradition? Yeah, right. No, the Essenes, the, the Essenes, the Sadducees, and the Pharisees are not. Those are not tribal. Uh, those are not tribal entities. They're non-tribal. They're sects. Right. So yeah. what sect then? What sect did he belong to originally? Well, um, he supposedly he grew up as a construction worker in Nazareth. Um, so he was he wasn't formally supposedly wasn't formally educated. Although there is a story of him. There's a story in the in the New Testament of him being a very adept at the Jewish literature when he's at the age of 12 visiting Jerusalem. Um, what, what was, what, the, what dominated in Nazareth was probably, they were, the, the, the rabbi there was probably more of a, maybe more of a Pharisee than an Essene, but it's hard to say. It's really difficult to say. Uh, the Essenes did have a, did have a fairly wide, a wide uh, range. They weren't just, they didn't, weren't just located in Qumran, um, they did. There were scenes in as far north as Antioch and uh, as far south as as Egypt. So they they weren't they weren't just limited to that to that monastery. So it is possible that he did, was introduced to the Essene perspective on on traditional Jewish literature when he when he grew up in in Nazareth. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, one thing that you mentioned was henotheism in Jewish yeah. literature, and that that seemed kind of surprising because they were, you know, so strong on uh, monotheism. So could you kind of sort that out a little bit? Well, the um, the, the monotheism came later on in in Jewish history. Um, the the heno, henotheism is is a, a focus on one deity uh, to the to the exclusion of others, and if you look at the way that the literature is written, the other deities are not denied except in the case of of idols. So it's mm -hmm. it's only with 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 human made deities that you see a real denial of of the of the divinity of the of the entity. I see. Okay. All right. And then the the other thing is, is is to exclude have that that is the exclusive the exclu have the the the, the so-called creator it's so the supposed cosmic creator as the exclusive the exclusive deity without without denying the existence of other deities which is which is henotheism is all about there's there's there was plenty of henotheism in 
in uh, pagan culture as well. So you had like, for example, the priests of Apollo focused only on Apollo, the priests of Isis focused only on Isis, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Could I just jump in and ask a question too? We yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I think maybe what David meant was Jesus came from the house of David, you know, and, and they, that was predicted that uh, some great leader was going to come from the house of David. Isn't that true? Well, there, yeah, there, there's, there, there were expectations that uh, that that there would be a uh, a, a worldly Messiah that would be in the Davidic line uh, or mesh, Meshia. And what does it mean to be a Messiah? It means to be anointed. So there are different ideas of what the, what the Messiah would do, what the Messiah would be all about. The Essene perspective on the Messiah was not one, was not the same as the, the Orthodox perspective. So Jesus was, was more like the Essene, an Essene version of the Messiah rather than a, rather than a Pharisaical version of the Messiah. So the Pharisaical Messiah would be like a like, like a king of the world, a world more of a worldly king. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And the Messiah, Messia, just means anointed. So there's all kinds of different anointing that that happens in in the ancient world. And to to be an, to be anointed doesn't necessarily mean you're a, you're an actual king. So for example. Um, David himself was anointed long before he actually became king. <laughs> so, he, you know, just because he had been anointed the king, to be anointed as the next king doesn't mean that he actually was a king after after being anointed. Yeah. I, and I just had, you mentioned so many interesting things, but um, my my perception of Jesus is that he was like, uh, you know, was one of the zealots, and he became very prominent not only because he knew a lot of Jewish history uh, and and you know what what was baptized by John the Baptist and everything but he also later challenged the Jewish authorities and the authority of Rome and that's one reason why he was put to death and then uh, I think I mean that's just my um, impression yeah yeah well no yeah he he was not he was <laughs> No, I don't think anybody anybody in Israel was really that happy about being under Roman domination. The only the only people that had that benefited from Roman domination were were the the aristocrats um, and and the and the priests. Um, so for but as far as being a zealot is concerned. The, the the zealots themselves were a lot more zealous than than Jesus was. His 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 zeal was 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 rather modest compared to the compared to the hard the hard nosed zealots who came um, a generation later and and rebelled against Rome. Um, the, those zealots were were like the the uh, were uh, practiced forms of assassination and things like that. Um, and they selected their they selected their priests using using lots based on lots and, and and stuff they drew lots so there are certain there's some differences there but they but they did have a connection with the Essenes and it seems that Jesus had a connection with the Essenes so um, yeah I, I would you just, to, to to see him as an as an anti um, an anti Jewish establishment, which was a, basically Roman collaborators. The, the, the Jewish establishment at that time were Roman collaborators, and that was one of the biggest reasons to to attack anybody who who had any claim whatsoever to, to any leadership was out of fear of of Roman retaliation. Okay, we're we're about out of time. Uh, like Jim, did you have a question? Maybe we'll make that our last question. Yeah, just one thing, Bob, uh, lots of really interesting connections. One, uh, one of uh, the importance of logos as, as, between religions and probably philosophies, maybe Eastern. Um, can you recommend a, a good book or a resource on uh, logos and its connection, its connective force? Oh, I don't think that I don't know of anybody who has who has done um, a, a full survey of all of the logos stuff um i i encountered a, a a franciscan candidate who said that he's specializing in logo studies but he meant he meant the the, the orthodox definition of logos 
Um, it, it's so it's it's so it pervades the the pagan literature of that era. So it's it's hard to it's hard to separate it from the from just the general philosophic literature. So uh, it, it just uh, an overview of 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 the pagan philosophy of the time reveals a bunch of, of different logos connections there. And there's even there is even an it, it's even interesting. There's even uh, something that I encountered recently there's a, a similar logos connection in um in the the proverbs where um let's see here it is there's a, there's a line in proverbs oh no i i messed it up I'm sorry <laughs> um yeah it says uh da, 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 da. The words of a man's mouth are deep waters. The wellspring of wisdom is a flowing brook. So that's very much in line with the pagan idea of logos. So that shows up even in the, the Solomonic literature. Okay. Uh, with that, Bob, we thank you very much. Uh, and Alrighty. Thanks to everyone for coming and hope you can join us uh, for one of our future events.